All right, I think we're live. Hey Ben, thanks for joining. Hey Nick, awesome. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm so excited to talk to you. Uh, but before we do that, for everyone watching on LinkedIn, click this video, go to my YouTube channel, click subscribe, like the video. That gives me the reassurance that you're enjoying this content and that I should do more of this. Um, with that being said, I'm super pumped to have one of my good friends, Ben Kaplan, on the podcast. Uh, ben is a privacy engineer at Google. He's going to tell us what privacy engineering is, how he landed that job, uh, and talk about his journey uh, to getting into the illustrious FANG group of companies here. Um, so before we do that, you know, I like to play a game, Ben. Uh, and for those who worked with us at OneTrust, we'll be familiar with your famous top fives. Uh, yes. So let's let's get into top fives here. We're going to start off because, Ben, you're a big runner, and we're going to talk about running at the end and your 100-miler that you attempted. Uh, what are your top five running songs? All right. So, so this is tough for me because I don't typically run listening to music, but... You know, when thinking about it, you want something that's going to be inspiring. You want something that's going to pump you up, get you through those tough miles. So I'll go from number five down to number one. Uh, number five, I have Wrecking Ball by Miley Cyrus. And I have that specifically for when you're going up hills and doing a hill workout. Um, it's a little bit slower of a song, but when it gets to that crescendo, you know, maybe you reach the top of that hill and that feels really good. So I have that Wrecking Ball is number five. Number four, uh, I have anything, anybody who knows me knows I love Taylor Swift. So number four, I have anything off the Reputation album for Taylor Swift. That's when she switches from a little bit of more of the country slow stuff into more of the pop stuff. So you get kind of that faster beat, higher tempo music. So that should be good for a nice steady pace. Uh, love it, love it. Number three is a classic, uh, Lose Yourself, Eminem. You know, that, that gets you pumped up, gets you ready to go you know, makes, makes you think you could take on the world. So I have that as number three. And then the top two are both theme songs from, from different movies. Uh, number two, I have the Space Jam theme song. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it has a, a real name for a song, but uh, that's just a, you know, great fast paced song. Maybe do some sprints to that. And then of course, number one is the classic, the Rocky theme song. You know, it doesn't get more more iconic than Rocky running up the steps with that music in the background. So that would be good for some some steps or bleachers, workouts, whatever you want to do there. Um, but yeah, that's it. that's my top five running songs. I can see you pumping Rocky as you're running yep. down Peachtree here. Yeah, exactly. Probably a little too hot for the sweats right now that he had. But, you know, still still a solid song. I love that. Uh, all right. We'll we'll get into why I'm asking this one, but top five mathematical theorems. Okay. Yeah. So this is another tough one because there, there are lots of good ones. And then <laughs> we'll get into my, my math background in, in, in a few minutes here, but it's been a long time since I've dealt with the serious math. Um, but I have a top three for you. Okay. I'll uh, take it. Number three is, is all about pi. So everybody knows pi, circumference over diameter, you get 3.14, you know, a bunch of digits. Um, there's a theorem that proves that it's an irrational number. So it goes on forever. The quotients, you know, you can't take the quotient uh, one over another and get pi as a number. So that makes it irrational. Um, again, I don't remember exactly how to prove it and what, what the theorem actually is, but it's just cool to think about pi and, um, you know, how how the numbers came to be and just how it goes on forever. And then you have those people who can recite, you know, thousands of digits of pi, which is insane. Uh, so I have that in the number three slot. Um, okay. The number two slot. Uh, so proving that there are infinite prime numbers. Um, so for those who don't know, a prime number is a number that's only divisible by itself and the number one. Um, and just, my mind always seems to break when I start to think about infinity in general. Like you just, there's just always more numbers. Uh, <laughs> and then just to think that there are more prime numbers and how we figure that out is really interesting. And there are actually supercomputers that 
their sole job is to figure out what the next highest prime number is because it goes on forever. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a weird one. And I just like to think about it because it hurts my brain a little bit. Uh, <laughs> and then number one should be no surprise to anyone. It's the classic Pythagorean theorem. That has to be number one. Everybody knows it. A squared right. plus B squared equals C squared. You find the hypotenuse. It's very useful, kind of. So, so famous, yeah. famous one. You, you can't beat <laughs> Pythagorean. And I, I had a professor in college who he said, and, and at one point I knew like three different ways of how to actually prove the Pythagorean theorem. But he always said, you need to know how to prove the Pythagorean theorem. If you're at a party, it's a great party trick. I've never brought it out at a party, but you know, for those who, who want to know, look it up. You can bring it out at a party and people will be maybe impressed. I don't know. So try it out. See what happens. Life of the party. I'm sure that <laughs> professor is. <laughs> yeah. He's a little, little oddball as most, most math professors are. I love it. Uh, and then rounding us up, top five privacy laws slash privacy rights. And that'll bring us full circle here. Yeah. So I just kind of picked the ones that, that I deal with the most. Um, there's no other real story behind them or, or rationalization. And they're just kind of the ones that I'm most familiar with. Sure. Uh, so in the number five slot, we have CPRA. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, the new California guy that's, that's coming into effect. Um, new kid on the block. Yeah, brand new to the game, but quickly made the top five list. So, <laughs> so it's got some some legs there. Uh, number four, we're going to go up to Canada, uh, Pipeta, and um, you know I've done a little bit of work with with that, but always good to keep keep check on the uh, our friends north of the border here in, in Canada. So yeah. I have them in the number four slot. Number three, um, the big one in America from from a couple years ago now, CCPA giving rights to the, the good folks of California for, you know, deleting their data, requesting their data. Um, you know, that was a, a fun one to implement the consumer rights workflows and, and things like that. Oh, I still have battle scars from that one. <laughs> I think, I think we all do. Um, it was, it was like pulling teeth with, with some of the organizations. I think we were working with Nick on yeah. how to actually implement it, what, you know, what the law actually said versus what it meant and, and things like that. Um, so a lot of banging our heads against the wall as I'm, I'm, I'm sure you remember, but still a very important, important law in, uh, in the U S number two, uh, we're going to go down to Brazil with LGPD. Um, okay. you know, for, for me, that's similar to the number one, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute, but yeah, just have done some, some solid work on LGPD down in Brazil, specifically around, you know, data protection impact assessments and legitimate interest assessments and data sharing and things like that. So there's a lot of interesting pieces of, of the puzzle there. And then that gets us again to another classic number one. And this is really kind of what launched my privacy career is, is GDPR, of course. Um, of course. You know, I got into privacy back in 2017 and it was a year before GDPR went into effect. So you know, my first year was all about GDPR. Um, so that's probably my number one. The big, the big guy who kicked us all off, gave us all our careers here, Mr. Yeah. GDPR. I like it. Um, awesome, Ben. Well, I love these games. I love your top fives. Uh, and who, anyone who worked with us early one trust knows uh, you're a legend for these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Notebook full. Um, awesome, man. So would love you to kind of give a little intro on your on yourself and, and what you're up to kind of gave uh, kind of gave it away here. But um, would love to hear from yourself and then talk a little bit about, you know, what is privacy engineering and, and what does that mean? It's a fairly new role in a lot of organizations. A lot of companies are trying to figure out uh, how do they start a privacy engineering program? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um Fair warning and, and kind of a disclaimer. So I'm, I'm currently in week number two at Google as a privacy engineer, and this is my my first privacy engineering role. Um, so it's all still very new to me. Um, that being said, I'm happy to kind of give my two cents a, as what I think it is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to me, privacy engineering kind of deals with the intersection of the software development lifecycle and engineering and privacy principles. 
So it's all about how do we implement privacy practices during the engineering phases in a technical way. So that could mean doing things like anonymization, pseudonymization, encryption, maybe even some type of, of machine learning, things like that. Um, and then the other piece too, at least what, what from my understanding is the consulting piece as well, um, which Nick, both you and I have a little bit of a consulting background, but to me, you know, you have these engineering teams who maybe aren't thinking about privacy first right? They just want to build things fast, especially in big tech. They want to build things fast. They want to move quickly, new features, new products. And privacy isn't necessarily necessarily on their roadmap and radar. And that's kind of where the privacy engineers come in. They're very early on in the development life cycle where we can raise a flag and say, hey, did we consider this aspect of privacy or how we would implement you know, going back to anonymization or encryption or stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so it's really about having a seat at the table early with the software engineers and making sure that the privacy side is raising their concerns and getting their fair shake at the table as well. So that way, when it comes time to launch a product, all the privacy concerns, or at least most of them have been met, risks have been mitigated or at least lowered, and you're feeling comfortable with launching a product that's going to be safe for the users. Yeah, I love that. So being early on in that life cycle, really liaising between engineering and the privacy team and helping embed, you know, privacy by design early on in that build life cycle. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, love that. Does that, you know, from what you're aware of, does that live under privacy? Does that live under engineering? Is that, you know, program management? Where does that function live? You know, privacy works so cross-functionally across the entire organization. Um, you know, privacy, at least in my experience, has worked with marketing or HR or operations. In, in this case, while it sits in and I sit on a specific privacy team, mm. my team is integrated with one specific product. And I think that's partly because I'm at such a large company with many different products and, and areas. But... Essentially, I'm on the Google Cloud team and Google mm -hmm. Cloud under that umbrella has its own privacy team and has its own privacy engineering team. So mm -hmm. we're getting very, very granular. And a lot of companies aren't going to be able to do that in terms of resourcing. They might just have one privacy team and the privacy folks are spread across the entire organization, regardless of product. But I think this way makes a lot of sense because then you have privacy people who are very specialized in their knowledge of a specific product. And as they, you know, I'm hoping as I ramp up and understand the Google Cloud products more, right, I'll be really useful in saying, okay, I understand how we build our products. I understand what the development lifecycle is. And I know kind of maybe those pain points from a privacy perspective, and I can plug myself into those different areas. So I think it's interesting to have it set up in a way where you have the specialized, you know, SMEs, um, but I understand that not every organization is going to be able to to accomplish that. It makes a lot of sense. So there's a privacy team inside of that kind of product line, mm -hmm. and then carved out of that privacy team is the more technical uh, privacy engineering folks. So it kind of still lives under privacy, but assigned to that product line. Totally. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Uh, very cool. I, I know I'm talking to a lot of customers and we're all trying to figure it out, right? And, and learn best practices. So this is great. Yeah. Um, so with that, I, I'd love to kind of go all the way back to Ben Kaplan College and then, yeah. you know, go through uh, how you got into privacy, what that journey looked like, and eventually broke into Facebook and now Google um, cause a lot of people want to kind of take that track and, and want to understand what that looks like. Uh, and then would love some tips on how to interview for these companies, negotiate. Uh, and I, I and then lastly, want to talk about your running because that's yeah. what I'm trying to be better <laughs> at. And so I need some tips and tricks here. Uh, so let's, let's go back. Ben Kaplan college, Syracuse. Yeah. Applied math major. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. So you know, I, got, I went into college, undergrad, Syracuse, undecided in a major, but I'd always gravitated towards, you know, math, science, 
those sorts of sorts of things where, you know, you're, you're doing kind of that logical thinking. So I decided on a major in just what I was good at and what mm -hmm. I thought I liked. And that was double major in applied mathematics and chemistry. Um, and I'm not good at either. Of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people aren't and, and that's OK. And to be perfectly frank, I've forgotten a lot of that knowledge, unfortunately. Um, my brain dumped it so I can get all the, the privacy information yeah, in there. GDPR. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah, so, you know, I was, I was in undergrad, I was doing the chemistry stuff, doing the applied math stuff. And I was thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. And I really liked the science. I really liked chemistry, thought it was super interesting, you know, was, was reading a lot of published journal entries and articles and things like that and decided, you know what? I want to go to grad school for chemistry and I want to try and be a research scientist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, applied to some PhD programs, uh, got into a few places and decided I'm going to go to Georgia tech. Um, I'm going to get a PhD in inorganic chemistry. So I get there and the first year really is, you know, you're, you're taking classes, right? So the first year you're you taking start off with a master's first, like through the PhD program, or you already had your master's. No, so it's it's essentially a gimme. Um, so what okay. they do is you start and it's the average time it takes. It, it can vary, but the average time for a chem PhD is five to six years. Mm -hmm. So essentially, if you make it past year two, they'll give you the master's on the way to getting the PhD is essentially okay. how it works. Um, and the PhD is a good deal because they fully will cover your tuition. They'll give you a yearly stipend. Um, it's not much, but it's enough to live on if you're living like a, a student, right? Mm -hmm. So it's enough to, to break even essentially and, you know, eat and, and do all that stuff. So, you know, thought it was a good deal, came down the first year completely is coursework, which is, you know, similar to undergrad, a little bit higher level, of course. And then after that first year during the summer, you start to actually do research. So you mm -hmm. find a professor whose research you find interesting Hopefully they have a spot for you um, based off of their grants and things like that. So I joined a lab uh, that was actually studying something called negative thermal expansion. And essentially what okay. that is for, for people who don't know, which nobody really knows or cares, <laughs> honestly, um, essentially what that is, is most materials as you heat them up, they expand and get bigger. But there's a small class of materials that as you heat them up, they actually contract and get smaller, which is mm -hmm. an anomalous behavior. Um, so our group and the group that I worked in was interested in understanding why those specific materials contracted, what made them contract, whether it was pressure or heat or things like that. Um, so again, I found it really, really interesting. But then once I actually started to do the research, which is what I thought I wanted to do, mm. it was really slow moving. I was in a lab all day, not really interacting with many people. Um, and science just moves really slow. And so it was a little bit scary for me because I was on this trajectory and on this path to be a scientist. I'd invested all this time and money and my parents invested in me and, and all this stuff. And it was November of my second year of grad school. And our group actually did some work at Argonne National Laboratories just outside of Chicago. And they have something there that's, it's, a, it's essentially, I won't bore you with the details, but it's something that helps. Um, it essentially helped us with our experiments. And we had to use the facility. We had to make the most of our time. So we had to be there for 24 hours. And mm -hmm. so essentially me being the youngest on our team, along with one of my, um, my grad school friends, we had to work the night shift. So we were there from five or 6 PM until five or 6 AM, just me and him running these experiments. Nobody else was there. And that's when I realized I was like, all right, I can't, I can't <laughs> keep doing this. <laughs> right. This isn't for me. So I remember going home right before, or I, I went home for Thanksgiving, which was a few weeks after that happened. And I sat down with my parents and I was like, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to quit grad school. I, I, I don't think I can do it anymore. You pull one all nighter, Ben, and you're out. 
<laughs> I did. It, to be fair, it was a culmination of things, but that all nighter definitely did not help. And it wasn't just one all nighter. We were doing it for like an entire week. Um, mm. So I was just, I was just over it. I knew I didn't want to do it as a career. So I was like, why should I keep doing it? My parents convinced me to stay for one more semester because if I stayed for the two years, I would at least get my master's degree. Right. So I, I stayed one more semester. I got my master's degree. And then the question was, all right, what am I going to do next? I have no idea. Right. Um, so essentially, I took six months off to just try and figure life out, figure out what I want to do next, because I found, you know, it's very easy to know and understand what you don't want to be doing. It's much harder to understand what you do want to be doing. Yeah. And I think I think the big thing for me was I had to take a little bit of a leap because I had been on that path and a lot of people are on that one path, but I very quickly realized, you know, this isn't a career for me. This isn't going to make me happy. If I don't jump now, I don't know if I'm ever going to do it and I don't want to be miserable the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so that's part of my advice to people is if you're not happy with what you're doing, don't be afraid to change directions, switch gears, try something new. It's not too late, even if you've been doing the same thing for a long time or think you know what you want to do, it's okay to, to change your direction. Yeah, love that. Yeah. So essentially from there, I, I bounced around a little bit. Um, you know, I, when I was applying for jobs, I was just thinking, okay, what fits my skill set? Um, and what I landed on was being a business analyst. You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty logical, rational thinker. Um, I thought it would be interesting and, you know, a new challenge. So wound up becoming a business analyst for Fannie Mae of all, all places. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't that interesting. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it, yeah. And it's a very old organization and slow moving, <laughs> slow moving, exactly what I didn't want. And it's, you know, I didn't really care about the housing market that much or mortgages mm -hmm. and I didn't understand it. So, <laughs> so yeah, I was, I was just on a contract there luckily. So I had an out after six months. Um, mm. so I was only there for six months before getting more into the software world. And again, I wasn't, I was a business analyst, but I was on this, it was a, it was a startup. It was another strange company called base yeah. eight, um, that doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, but essentially I got into the world of, you know, software development and agile and understanding how to write requirements and user stories and things like that, which, you know, really was good experience and, you know, was starting to move in a direction that, you know, I liked a little bit better. And again, that was another contract position. Uh, so another six months there. And then I can't remember if I applied to OneTrust or if mm. a recruiter from OneTrust reached out to me. Um, but it, it happened very, very quickly where I came in, I, I interviewed with you <laughs> as, yep, as yep. one of the people uh, and, and one other person. And it, apparently it went well enough. I had to make a presentation on privacy, which I knew nothing about. Um, I think it was about uh, DPIAs or GDPR or one of those topics that you guys like to, to make us present and on. This is probably May 2017. Yes, yes. My, it, early, early May, late April, around that time frame. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then really the last step of the interview at, at that point in, in OneTrust life was meeting with our CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time he was traveling so much and so frequently that the only time he had to meet, meet with me was on a Sunday at like 4 PM, mm -hmm. uh, in the old one trust offices, which, you know, was, was small and, you know, not the nicest building in the world. So, <laughs> you know, went in there, met with him one-on-one, -on -one, got the offer, essentially just accepted the offer. Cause I was just, you know, wanted, wanted something new and different. Um, and then joins, I think, right after Memorial Day weekend, 2017. Yeah. So that's where mm -hmm. a year before GDPR. Yeah. Um, and we spend that next year teaching people, pri learning privacy. Yeah. Learning the law, teaching customers privacy and the law because they didn't know either. Uh, we're all still learning. And then implementing very early software. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And honestly, that was probably the most hectic, stressful, but fun time of my career so far, because I always I always used to say it was like 
our parents gave us the keys to the car and said like, you know, we're going out of town for the weekend and we could do whatever we wanted. Cause yeah. it was really, it was really the blind leading the blind. I didn't know what I was doing. Our customers didn't know what they were doing. The software was still really being built. It was in its nascent stages. Right. Um, but it was exciting and it was fast paced and it was exactly what I was looking for. And that's really where I became passionate about privacy because it's such a fast moving world. Things are changing all the time. New regulations are coming out. New technologies are being developed that maybe hasn't been accounted for from a privacy perspective. So that's really what I enjoy about it. And that's really what I like about it. And that's that's really what's made me stay in the, the privacy world for so long. Yeah, no, I, I can relate to that. I was going to ask in your top five questions, your top five managers, but I didn't <laughs> want to make everyone else feel bad. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, you you'd definitely be definitely be number one, honestly. I'm not fishing. I'm not fishing. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun time because I think when I joined, we were it was such a flat org. I don't think yeah. we had a manager <laughs> really. No, uh, we had nothing. <laughs> yeah. But then you um you kind of grew into into that role and you mentored me and a whole bunch of other people and really helped launch our our careers. So I'm forever grateful for for you for that. And um, yeah, you're definitely, definitely up there. Top five, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, and and then that goes to maybe one of the low points of my time at OneTrust is when you put in your notice. Uh, yeah. and, and so let's talk about where you went after that and uh, kind of how you used software startup to really accelerate your privacy career. Yeah, no, absolutely. So from OneTrust, I uh, took a position. So I was at OneTrust for just over two years. Um, and Ernst and Young were hiring for their data protection and privacy practice, really trying to build it up. Uh, so I left to go into the consulting world, which, you know, I got a little taste of at OneTrust being on the consulting side. But, you know, EY is a you know big four consultancy. They do have their arms in a lot of different places and thought it'd be really interesting to see what it's like as a, you know, a true big four consultant. So joined the data protection and privacy practice at EY as a senior consultant. Um, and it's funny because during the interview process, they're always making sure every single interview, they're like, just so you know, it's going to be, you're on a plane Monday morning, you're flying home Thursday night, you're home for the weekend. And then, you know, repeat, rinse and repeat. Right. And I was actually looking forward to that because I wanted the travel points, I wanted the free meals, I wanted all of this Play the stuff. Game. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Get get the points, fly my you know fiance at the time out with me. Um, but of course, the first project that I got on at EY was based in Atlanta, where where I'm based. Um, and then that was the only project I was on the entire time. So <laughs> I wound up staying in Atlanta, but essentially the work that I was doing there was very focused on CCPA. Mm -hmm. um, so I joined EY in, I want to say, July of 2019. And CCPA was going into effect in January of 2020. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the work I was doing was helping build and, and automate consumer rights workflows. So from the front end portal of how are people going to actually request their uh, personal information? How are they going to request for their data to be deleted? How are we going to verify they are who they say they are? And then the backend systems using data discovery tools to understand, okay, where do we actually as an organization keep the personal data and personal information? How do we link it and tie it to this person? Um, and then even going into more of the ticketing workflow of, how are we going to keep track of all of the requests? How are we going to give the request or the information to the consumers in you know, a meaningful report? Um, mm -hmm. So all of that, that kind of went into it. So really the one trust piece helped me a lot in terms of A, the privacy knowledge, but also B, the, the technology piece of software and understanding really how software gets built, what requirements are. And I'm not a super technical, I don't consider myself a technical person, even though I now have an engineering uh, <laughs> title in my, in my job. Um, I know enough to be dangerous and get by, but, you know, I understand how 
generally software is built and I understand how to write a user story and requirements and things like that. So that's all been super helpful. And the startup life definitely helped kind of me wear all those different hats and really get an understanding of what it looks like from the ground up. Yeah. A a pressure cooker to learn all these skills and Mm -hmm. uh, you go to EY, you you start to apply those. Um, 2019, I think for a lot of consultants and, and privacy professionals going into who picks Jan 1 as a regulation go live date? Yeah. I was on phone calls December 30th, 31st, New Year's. I'll spend on phone calls, <laughs> troubleshooting workflows with, Same. you know, Fortune 2 clients, like <laughs> trying to solve all this. Uh, never, never again. I, I will <laughs> protest any regulation that has a, a holiday go live date. <laughs> yeah. If that happens again, I might just quit the industry and not come back honestly you just come back a few days later <laughs> yeah yeah take a little a little hiatus for sure uh so you're you're at ey um and i remember talking to you about this when you were leaving one trust you were also talking to i think facebook um at That's the right. time and so I, I i think that role got filled before you know you were able to take it but you stayed in touch with that recruiter um so you can t- can you talk about kind of that path from UI now now to Facebook and how you maintain that relationship to ultimately landing a role there. Yeah, of course. So your your memory is correct. So when I was interviewing at EY, I was also interviewing at Facebook. Uh, they were called Facebook still at the time, now, <laughs> now Meta. Um, and I was going for a data protection manager role in their training and awareness program. And I got to the final stage where they flew me out to their headquarters in um, uh, just outside of Palo Alto and went out there, interviewed in person, thought it went really well. And I essentially got a note from a recruiter a week later that said it was between you and one other person. And we decided to go, the hiring manager decided to go with the other person because they had experience building an actual you know, privacy training program. And I didn't, to be fair. So yeah. totally understood that. Um, but what I decided to do from there, and I think this is an important tip for people, is I reached out to the hiring manager on LinkedIn. Um, we had a really good conversation. I felt good about it. And I just essentially said, you know, really appreciate your time, really appreciate you explaining the role and everything. Um, if you have any feedback for me, let me know. Or if there are any open roles in the future, you might think I'd be... you you think I might be a good fit for, please let me know. Yeah. And essentially he, he wrote back and said, thanks so much for the note. You're definitely Facebook material. Let's stay in touch. Mm-hmm. And essentially what I did was I just tried to keep that touch point, um, you know, every couple months, just as, you know, to, to have me in his mind and on his radar. And eventually it worked out and I I wasn't pushy about anything. I was just saying, Hey, here's what I've been up to at EY. Here's what I'm working on. How's everything on your end? And it was very simple, easy messages, not forcing anything, not saying, Hey, do you have a job for me yet? Yeah. Uh, Just to stay in touch. Right. Right. Just to stay in touch. And that was it. And so eventually he actually got me in touch with another guy um, who was actually higher up. It was his boss. And he was like, I, I want you to meet this person and talk to him. And so we had a meeting, I want to say December of 2019 or January of 2019, around the holidays, 2019, 2020. Um, and we just, we hit it off. We had a good rapport and everything. And that was it. That was the one time I talked to him. And then four months later, someone reached out to me, a recruiter reached out to me and said, Hey, someone's recommended you for this position at Facebook, would you be interested in talking? Mm. And the position was a little bit different than what I was used to. It wasn't technically on the privacy team. It was on the information governance team. But this guy who I had talked to back in January was the person who vouched for me and the person who kind of passed my resume along and said, hey, you should look at this guy. I think he might be a good fit. Oh, great. Yeah, I love that. And so building that relationship kind of giving a status update, mm-hmm. having a, you know, a good reputation really um, now has brought you to the recruiter and, and kind of helping them find you a new role. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so I interviewed for that role. Um, 
you know, this was a different team, different hiring manager and everything, but I already had kind of the, the vouch from the guy who was higher up. So that definitely, I think really gave me a leg up, um, wound up getting the role, which was amazing. Uh, moved out to California for a little bit before, you know, everything was, was kind of moved to more remote. Um, but yeah, so, you know, really at, at Facebook, I was working again, leveraging that same experience I had at both one trust and at, at EY where essentially we we're building internal tools. Of course, this time at Facebook, it was more internal facing than, you know, consulting with clients, which we can get into a little more, but I, I prefer that I think, um, for a lot of reasons. Um, but yeah, essentially it was creating records of processing activities, which for a company like Facebook is not so easy, um, because they're creating new products, new features, essentially every single day. Uh, and they're collecting new pieces of information, new, uh, personal information also, daily, right? So how do we keep up with that as an organization? How do we automate a lot of the process so we're not pulling resources in every single day when we need to, you know, create these processing activities? And then also, how do we, how do we have it easily accessible? So when a regulator comes and asks for this information, we have it readily available and can hand it to them. And that's really important at a company like Facebook, who's always under so much scrutiny from the regulators, right? right. We, they can't ask us for something and it take us a month to get back to them because then we're kind of caught red handed, right? Where it's like, obviously we didn't document this information. So it was really important that we came up with the, the more proactive side of having a repository of this information where we could just hand it off to the regulators whenever we needed to. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And one question I always, you know, a lot of companies try to figure out, I, I'd love your take not to get too privacy heavy here, but, you know, in a processing activity in Europa, how deep do you go? When do you stop it? Right. How, how deep do you document it? What, what have you seen? I'd love to hear. Yeah. So what I've seen is, you know, I think a lot of companies do it really granularly, or at least that's what, uh, what I always try and do, because it's easier if you have that level of granularity to level up and make it higher level, <clears throat> depending on who the audience is. So if you're starting at that you know, really low level um, and you have all of the details, maybe you have all of the specific data elements, even though you only really need the data categories, right? When you want to hand it off to the regulator, you don't have to give them all that information. You can, you know, take some stuff out that's not fully necessary. You know, I think one thing that we did at Facebook, for instance, is we had a list of, you know, the systems and applications that might be involved in a certain process. Well, if you look at Article 30 of GDPR, you don't necessarily need to have the systems. So we would take that piece of information out if a regulator asked for you know, the processing activities for data sharing between WhatsApp and Facebook, for instance. Right. Um, so I think getting granular is just good practice because it's also good at understanding your organization as a whole. Um, so even internally, you know, not for privacy reasons, but if somebody's trying to understand how data is flowing between different systems in your organization, it's really helpful to have that information documented somewhere. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And you can be granular and then you can just say, hey, this is all HR and right. just make it a little more uh, bucketed than have all the details if you need to share it. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I love that, man. Um, so from there, you've recently moved to Google. Um, can you talk a little bit about that transition? And then I, I'd love to get into you know, your interviewing tips, a lot of folks on the market right now trying to break into kind of um, big tech and just move into privacy program roles uh, and, and looking to, to interview. So interviewing tips and then negotiating tips, which is not my strong suit. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so yeah, so wasn't really looking for a new role specifically. I was in, enjoying Facebook, Meta, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when a recruiter reaches out on LinkedIn from from Google, you kind of, I, I felt you have to kind of see what's going on there, right? Because yeah, yeah. Google is one of those 
companies that a lot of people want to work for. You hear all about the benefits and the pay and, you know, all the good stuff. Plus so many people in the world use it. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think even more so than, than Facebook, you know, not everybody's on social media or WhatsApp or has, you know, a VR headset, but you ask, you know, nine out of 10 people, at least in the United States, and they've probably Googled something today, right? Yeah. Or YouTube um, did. One yeah. Or YouTube did, or are watching us right now on YouTube. So, yeah. so yeah, so it was super, super interesting. And it was also, you know, as, as interesting as the work at Facebook was, I wasn't on, I wasn't on the privacy team per se. I was on the InfoGov side. So I really was interested in getting back really deep into that privacy world. Um, so they reached out about privacy engineering. And my, my first question to the recruiter was, how technical is this position? Uh, you know, mm-hmm. like I was saying before, I'm not a super technical guy. I don't know how to code. You know, I, I can look at a technical document and maybe after a few reads, understand it after asking a lot of questions, understand it, but I'm not a super technical person. Right. And their answer to me was really interesting. And they have a, a variety of different levels of privacy engineers. Some of them are actually coding. Others are maybe just looking at the code. And then others are more of that programmatic privacy engineer where it's more of that consulting piece that we were talking about earlier, where it's you're really relying heavily on your privacy knowledge more so than your technical know-how. So that's really where the conversation started. And I was like, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm game to interview. Let's, let's see how it goes. And Google is, is notorious for their long interview process. Um, mm-hmm. So they reached out to me and I started interviewing in January of this year, 2022. Um, the first couple rounds of interviews were very, I'd say for me, they were technical in nature and it was very, the questions were very hypothetical. Um, it was about, you know, a, a product that maybe didn't exist and they wanted me to kind of call out what my privacy concerns are or mm. what privacy practices would I implement to make it better, whether it's access controls or, or things like that, uh, how I would go about implementing it. And what was really interesting about the interviews was they dug deeper and deeper into my answers. It wasn't like, okay, we're going to ask you a question and then you answer and then we move on to the next question. It was more so we're going to ask you a question. We're going to see what your answer is. And then based off of your answer, we're going to ask you a, a, sp- a more specific and pointed question, trying to poke holes in your answer. Right. Um, so it was really interesting because in some places I was more than happy to defend my answer because it, you know I really believed it. And then other times they would ask a question and I would realize how off base my, my answer actually was. And I would have to kind of backtrack a little and be like, oh, you know what? That's actually a, a really good point you bring up. I, I didn't really think about that. Um, but I think really the important point for me in, in those conversations and interviews was just being really confident. And even when I don't didn't know the full answer, I could at least talk about what I thought might be a good solution. Right. And the interviewers are typically very willing to guide you in the right direction or help out as long as they hear your thought process out loud. So you can't just sit there and be like, Oh yeah, maybe this, maybe that you have to really be confident in your answer. Don't say, I don't know. Um, even if you don't know, just try and, you know, talk it out a little bit and the interviewers really do help you a lot. So those were more of the technical interviews. And then they have the famous like Googliness interview. Um, (laughs) which to me was really, who are you as a person? What's your character? Is it, are you somebody who I would want to work with? Um, which I think is, is definitely a factor. So those were a little bit easier for me, I think. Uh, I like to consider myself a, a personable guy. So mm-hmm. um, that was more about you know, leadership qualities and you know, how you interact with a team and what your you know, cultural impact would be at, at the company. So went through, a few interviews. Um, and then the interesting part about Google, and, and this was a little bit frustrating part about the Google interviews is you get done with the interviews. And so I had my first two interviews one week, my second two interviews the following, or maybe two weeks later, but then they tell you, okay, you're like, 
we got the green light, we're ready to hire you. Now we're going to put you into something called team matching, right? So even though they say they're going to hire you, they don't give you an offer. You essentially have to do team matching. They don't call it interviews, but essentially it's another interview with the specific hiring manager because a lot of different teams are looking for a privacy engineer, a software engineer, a product manager, whatever the role you're going for is, and you need to align with one of those specific teams. Um, so you're interviewing for a generic role where yeah. Google knows there's demand, but now you need to go find the role on the team. You need to go find the team to fill that role. Right. And this kind of goes back to what we were saying about Google being such a big organization and having many different branches and arms. There are so many teams that you could be a part of and work on. And a lot of them do need privacy engineers, but you need to find a, a fit that's good for you as the, the candidate mm -hmm. and then be one where the manager thinks you're a good fit as well. So it was really interesting because some of those conversations with the manager were really felt like another interview where they were asking about my experience and my background and asking more of those hypothetical questions. Uh, and then others were way more about, you know, you ask me questions, like me to ask the manager questions and try and understand what the team culture is, what the style of the manager is and things like that, more like I was interviewing them. So right. that was really interesting to, to see. And then essentially what happens is you know, you might have one team that wants you, you might have two, you might have three. Um, and then you get to choose if you have multiple matches, essentially. Um, but the whole process, you know, from start to finish. And so let me take a back step here. So after you do the team match and you accept and your manager accepts you, then starts the offer and negotiation stages, sure. which can take more time, of course, if you're not kind of close to, to the same expectations. Um, so from start to finish, you know, I started the process in late January and I didn't have an offer from them until late April. Um, okay. so it took a good four months probably from, from start to finish, which is a long time, but, you know, I've heard other people get in the team match phase and they just can't find a match for one reason or another. Um, so for instance, one that I thought felt really good about decided to take an internal candidate instead of an external candidate. Um, someone else who I talked to didn't want someone who was based on the East Coast. They only wanted West Coast people. So there are a lot of factors besides who you are that kind of go into it. Um, so it could be a really long and, and frustrating process. But, you know, at the end, definitely, definitely worth it, I think. No, it's exciting. Happy for you here, man. Uh, great to see kind of that progression and fun to see like, you know, we're just kids trying to figure yeah. out privacy and, and now there's like careers. In it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Give me some interviewing tips, tricks and how to negotiate as you're moving into a new role. Yeah. So interviewing tips, definitely prep, um, you know, look up if you can some some companies will not share who the interviewer is before the interview and i've had that before um but a lot of them will tell you at least you know <clears throat> first and last name go look them up on linkedin understand where they've been before how long they've been at the current company come with questions that's an obvious one you want to show that you're interested in not just the company as a whole but more specifically the role and how the team operates I think that's really, really important. And it kind of shows your passion coming through when you ask those more specific and granular questions. I think the other thing that's important and, you know, a lot of the companies that I've interviewed with that are big tech don't really care how you're dressed, right? You don't need to wear a collared shirt. You don't need to wear a suit or anything like that. Um, but I think it's really important to speak clearly, you know, be confident when you talk, um, have some of those basic, you know, background stories and anecdotes that go to, you know, your, I think they call it the, the star method and you probably right. know, know better than me. I always forget what it stands for strengths. Um, it's been a minute since I've yeah. talked. <laughs> yeah. For those of you at home, Google the, the star method. Um, but it really essentially goes through, you know, what you did in a certain time period, 
um, what were some of the challenges, how you overcame those challenges, what maybe you would do differently. So have at least, you know, four to five stories like that in your back pocket, because a lot of the interviews are going to ask similar questions about, you know, tell me a time when, you know, you, an outcome didn't turn out how you wanted, or tell me a time you had a conflict with someone at work and how you went about it. And you can't just give a, a basic answer like, well, I've never had a conflict with a coworker before, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's important to have those stories and, and, and practice those stories. And then the other piece of advice is, you know, especially being in the privacy world and in such a hot space, you know, you probably have recruiters reaching out to you a fair bit. And it's okay to, you know, reject them and, and you know, tell them, you know, I'm not interested at this time. But I always, number one, respond to them. And number two, say, let's stay connected in case something changes in the future. Mm-hmm. And I've had, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had in the past a recruiter who was working for a company that I wasn't that interested in, who reached out to me and I essentially told him, uh, thanks, but no thanks, but let's stay connected if anything changes. He actually moved to another company that I was interested in. And when I saw him change on LinkedIn, uh, which by the way, LinkedIn is like, your best friend. That's how I've gotten all my jobs essentially since one trust uh, through LinkedIn. So make sure you, you know, keep that updated regularly, regularly, but essentially when this recruiter reached uh, switch companies, I reached back out to him and we started up a conversation again about what a potential role would look like there. So I think that's really important too, is just build your network, stay connected, um, you know, reach out to people in the industry, I think is really important and then just go from there. No, that's great. Um, now, how do I negotiate? What does that look like? What do people get wrong here? You know, it's it's definitely a, an acquired skill. And I wouldn't say I'm great at it. And there's a lot of conflicting advice online, right? Yeah. You see, And I've looked up all the advice because, you know, like, like you said, we're kids just trying to figure it out. But, you know, some people will say you want to give a range for, for your salary expectations. Others say let them give you the range. And, you know, I've kind of played, played a little bit with both. And what I've started to do is I flip the question back, right? I never make the first move anymore because <laughs> I've done that before. And I feel like I lowballed myself a little bit, a couple of yeah. times, um, or I've gotten to the point where they gave me the offer. And then I was like, uh, maybe let's, I know I said this, but now I'm thinking oh, actually yes. this, right, <laughs> right. They like, they come to the, my compensation request too quickly. I'm like, damn, I should have, I should have asked for more. So I've kind of flipped the script a little and said, you know, I, I put it back on the recruiter and say, I'm not hundred percent sure right now, but you know, would love to hear what the potential range is for, uh, for this role mm-hmm. and something that, uh, has started to happen and in, in Colorado passed a law recently yeah. where they have to have the range in the job description. So I really hope that happens for a lot of roles moving forward because that would be really useful and take a lot of, you know, put a lot more transparency in it um, instead of just going into a black box. Yeah, I've seen, I think Microsoft uh, has committed to putting all their ranges and all their job postings. Yeah, which is, which I think is great for, for the employees. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, especially in big tech, there's a lot of different pieces of your compensation package that you could try and wiggle around a little bit. (laughs) So for instance, both at Facebook and Google, the way it works is you get an offer of base salary, target bonus percentage of that base salary, uh, and then an equity piece as well. But where they don't have flexibility as much is what I've found is the base salary. So Mm -hmm. the base salary, depending on your level is a pretty set range and you could vary between that range, but where they do have a lot more flexibility is with the equity piece or asking for a sign on bonus or something like that. So these are all things that you can ask for to really up your offer. Um, I, you know, the best piece of advice I got, and this was when I was ne- trying to negotiate with Facebook, uh, which they actually didn't move on their initial offer, even though, you know, I was I was very happy with their initial offer, but I felt like I should negotiate. And I think that's another tip is 
no matter what the offer is, even if it blows you out of the water, the first one they give you, you should still ask for more. You have nothing to lose. And, yeah. and that's really what my dad told me because I was so nervous that I was going to say something or they would feel like I wasn't grateful for the offer. But that's in reality not how it works, right? You're, you're talking to the recruiter. You're not talking directly to the hiring manager in most cases. And they're not going to rescind your offer unless you you know, say something offensive, I feel like. Yeah. Um, so really, the worst thing that they can say is no. So don't be afraid to ask for more, whether it's on the base piece or more, um, you know, more bonus or a sign on or something like that. Even more, I've, ha- I've heard people ask for additional vacation days or, or things like that. Um, so there's a lot of different pieces that, that you can wiggle around a little bit. And then I think my biggest piece of advice, and, and this just happened to work out for me, and I know it's not always possible, but in big tech, competing offers are, are really the way to get a lot more. Um, mm-hmm. You know, essentially, it worked out for me where it was the same time with multiple offers, and you have all these companies that are competing for talent, essentially, and are willing to move the needle a little bit more in order to get you to come there over their rival. So yeah. if it's possible, if you can interview at multiple places at once, it's definitely worth doing. Um, and then just interviewing in general, I think the more reps you get, the better you get at it. You know, it's not so easy for a lot of people to talk about themselves, about their experience, um, just kind of get the hang of it. But if you do it often enough and kind of keep those, you know, those skills sharp, I think it'll be really beneficial. Yeah, that's great. I, I love that. Um, it's a skill, right? And yes. a lot of folks go a lot of years without interviewing, looking, even talking to recruiters, testing their their market value. And they, you'll definitely be surprised kind of what's out there. Yeah. Inflation's high, companies are looking and, and now's, now's a, a time to kind of check your, your worth uh, on the open market. Definitely, for sure. Awesome, man. Um, all right, I'll, I'll give it to you. Dealer's choice. We talk about running, uh, or we save that for a follow-up episode, uh, and I get to have you back on the podcast. Hmm. Maybe let's do a follow-up episode on on the running stuff. All right, I'm going to hold you to it. Uh, we need to talk about running. Your hundred miler. I need some running tips, but we will make that a part two a part due to this podcast. Perfect. Little little teaser and cliffhanger for, for folks on uh, who are subscribed to Nick's channel here. Yeah, love it. Um, awesome, Ben. Well, I can't thank you enough for, for joining this. Um, we know a lot of folks in the privacy space, a lot of folks in the market right now. So I think they're going to get a ton of value for, for what you went through. So on behalf of them, thank you, man. Of course. Uh, And for anyone who made it this far in the podcast, you know, I appreciate it. I appreciate you watching this. Um, If you have questions for Ben, you know, leave it in the comments, Uh, find him on LinkedIn, DM him uh, and let him know to stay in touch and maybe he'll help you find your next role as well. Um, Give me a like, a thumbs up, a subscribe if you like this video and we will be back next week for our next episode as well. Uh, This is episode, I think this is going to be episode seven. Uh, Goal is 10 episodes very consistently. Goal is 1,000 subscribers by the end of the year, Ben. What do you give me? What what, uh, what, what are the odds of me hitting that? Give me the over under. What are you at right now? Do you know? 117 as of this recording. Okay. Uh, Let's say 50-50. All right. Yeah, that's a fair (laughs) guess. (laughs) we'll try and boost them for you yeah love it yeah all right uh thanks everyone and we'll see you at the next episode have a good one